I'm going to give just a little overview of this, even before we get in-depth in the notes. And again, it's 40 pages, so we're just going to just skim over it, because the point is that you would study it uh, more later, at a later time. And so, it's the bride's final intercession and her final revelations. We ended in verse 7, where it says that if a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, would be utterly despised. And I talked about that proverb, the meaning of it being that the, the reward of a lover is the power to feel loved and to love in return. The reward of a lover is the ability to love, the ability to, to experience love, the two-way love. And what's happening in verse 8 to 14 is the reward of the lover in, in an earthly, in a natural sense, she's experiencing it. We could call this session the romanced heart, the overflowing heart, the sealed heart. It's what she experiences as a gift from Jesus to her for her spiritual violence, her radical obedience. Even before eternity, she lives free from fear. She lives in the romance of the gospel in the most intense way that can be described on, on this side of heaven. Her emotional life is being described here, uh, be, being described here. The Lord has touched her. And again, uh, the reward of the lover is now upon her. The romance tart is fully flowing right here. She opens her heart and she tells us how she feels like no other time in the entire song. This describes what the bride is feeling in the romance of the gospel like no other time. We've seen her love for Jesus, but this is her, uh, her feeling uh, in just the way, uh, her, what she's experiencing in, in life, not just in the fact that she loves the Lord, what she sees about herself, etc. Again, I want to mention how we uh, started last session. The Lord beautifies everything He touches. We come to Him, we're going to give the wealth of all of our house for love. We're going to uh, attempt to outgive the Lord. We're going to give Him in such a costly way, and in the process of giving it in the spirit of truth, we're caught up and lost in something so much bigger and so much more powerful than anything we imagined. And then the very sacrifice appears as rubbish and as nothing because the reward on this side, not just in eternity, is vastly bigger than anything we imagined. The lifestyle to give everything has even on, in the earthly dimension, a reward greater than any other. We talk about the heavenly reward. Well, this is her earthly reward. This is what she carries with her everywhere she goes. The dynamic of the bride is she carries the reward in her heart where no rust can destroy it, no moth can eat it. She carries the reward everywhere unlike any other person in life. Every other person, their reward is in the trophy case or in the bank account or, or it's the title or the position they, ha they have in the organization. She can be in prison and the reward is pounding in her heart as strong as if she's on a mountaintop in the most uh, beautiful circumstances. She is free from fear. The Lord says, you've come to give everything to me. You've come to sacrifice and to pour yourself out in a costly way and even on the earth. I have so beautified your heart, I have so romanced you on this age that you carry more reward than all the others of the earth, even on this side. Because we carry the reward in a way that very penetrates the very essence of our spirit. So that's the Lord's gift to her, even on, on this side. There's three basic themes going on in here, of which I, I've broken down a bit more than that, but I'm just going to sum it up. The first theme is in verse 8 and 9, it's the... It's, again, I'm going to relate it to the apostolic leadership of, Ch of Song of Solomon 7 and 8. It's that apostolic passion she feels for the church in verse 8 and 9. I don't have this in the notes. I'm summing up three or four pages here. It's an apostolic passion for the church, the, the joy of the first commandment. She not only has joy in the, fir I mean, the first commandment, I mean she has joy in the second commandment. The overflowing life of love for God and for people. That's verse 8 and 9, the, the passion, the apostolic passion Paul felt for the weak church. She feels it, and she's lost in the romance of feeling such passionate love for others. We were created by a loving God to be a lover of people, not just a lover of God. We're created to be a lover of people because He's a lover of people. 
When we walk in the second commandment, we resonate from the inside out with the power to love. It's one thing to love God. It's an entirely different thing to love people. It's a lot easier to love God. He's so perfect and so beautiful. But this resonating, this heart overflowing in power, that's part of the gift she carries. The second thing uh, in verse uh, 10, 11, and 12 is this tremendous sense of uh, this uh, overflowing heart. She feels peaceful. She feels successful. She feels relevant. She feels invincible. She feels powerful. She feels strong. It's more than just that she feels love for God. Her life feels so significant and so successful. She is free from fear, free from shame, free from irrelevance, free from the sense of waste, free from self-doubt, free from this negative self-conscious. She's resonating on the inside out. No one in life lives that way except for a bride in the spiritual violence of radical commitment. Even believers that have been forgiven, they don't, many of them, most believers don't enter into the joy of the feeling of successful and relevant and powerful and invincible, and this is how she feels, and we'll develop that. That's in verse uh, uh, 10, 11, and 12. It's, it's the gift of Jesus to everyone who's given everything to him. It's the gift on this side, not just in eternity. And uh, uh, another theme that, that she touches in verse 11 and 12 is, is the sense of relevance that she feels in, in, uh, uh, in context to eternity. She sees the vast significance of her small, earthly decisions that seemed insignificant to people. They seem so significant to her because they're relevant and they're remembered forever in eternity. When we understand that the small things of this age that appear insignificant to the unrenewed mind, are relevant and remembered forever. It crowns our life with dignity. The fear of wasting our life, the sense of of just sitting over in the corner, out of the way, just wasting away is completely gone. Matthew 10, verse 42, even a cup of cold water, the smallest act of obedience is remembered and relevant forever and forever and forever. And she lives in the feeling of that. The idea that most of us have, almost believers and unbelievers, are waiting so desperately for some day on the earth when our life matters. And even believers are pained, I mean in turmoil and anguish, as well as unbelievers are, for the mysterious day in their earthly life when things will appear to matter and they will really seem like they make a difference. And most people, no matter how powerful they get, almost always live in the plague of feeling irrelevant and insignificant. But she, enters, she has the ability to see the, the, ins, the what appears insignificant, the small things, relevant and remembered forever. Hebrews 6.10 is another verse. I don't have it written in here. Jesus said, even the, the smallest acts of kindness you've done for people, because you love me, I will remember it or I will count myself, consider injustice against myself if I forget one act that you've shown in love to my name by ministering to another person. One cup of cold water. God says, if I forget one cup of cold water, charge me with injustice. But I tell you, not one deed will be forgotten. And he he will crown us forever in the the overflow of those uh, acts of obedience. Like I've mentioned several times, the pay scale is so outrageously disproportionate. One little movement of our heart has... extravagant, exorbitant pay return in eternity. He's looking at every way possible to reward us and crown us. He's generous, and he sees every movement of our heart. She enters into that feeling of relevance and power and invincible. Nobody can take anything from her that matters ultimately in who she is. What a powerful feeling. Most people, even believers, live... They feel irrelevant. They feel left out. They feel weak and broken in in a different sense than she feels here. She says, I carry the reward everywhere with me. Put me in prison. I'll sing the love songs to God. Take everything from me. And my spirit is alive on the inside. Paul the Apostle entered into that kind of romance that she describes in verse 8 to verse 14. It's absolutely magnificent. The idea that we're training in this age 
And the training matters for the age to come is a wonderful reality. Every cup of cold water you give is part of the training. It's part of the course. It's part of, of that which God has set before you. I was uh, uh, just uh, pondering the, the, uh, uh, an interview I heard some years ago of the Olympic athletes. And I just found out tonight it was in the 1980 Olympics in, in Moscow, the Olympic athletes that, and the Americans that trained. And when Jimmy Carter, because of the Afghanistan invasion, uh, said the U.S. would boycott the Olympics, they trained for four years. And a number of these athletes, they were retiring after the Olympics. So it's not like they were young in four years and it just kind of brought them to the uh, next uh, level of skill. Some of them were, were retiring, and there, some of them were interviewed. I remember hearing it, and the devastation. These athletes said, we trained four years, and this is it. We're retired now. There is no other Olympics. This is it. It was for nothing, and the pain and devastation. Beloved, every movement of our heart that no human sees, it matters. It's real. Now, with that, if that touches you, your life changes entirely. Not one day, not one day is irrelevant. You may never be known by man. You may never have an unusual anointing. You will never make an impact in history possibly. But every day is full of meaning in life. And this is the romance she enters into. She sees that everything that the Lord has offered to her, she said yes to him in it. And whether it's large or small in the arena of man, it's eternally significant to God and therefore to you. And she lives in the power of it in the present tense. Oh, I want to enter into that in a greater way. Well, where do we go now? Let me see. I'm going to have to give a real abbreviated one. Third thing. Oh, I forgot the third thing. I forgot what I was thinking. Sorry. (laughs) The third thing. Anyway, I'm sure I'll get to it. I'm just lovesick to enter into what I'm preaching right now. I'm just thinking, man, forget this class. I want to go get into this. I want to get lost in this. I'm I'm somewhere else right now. Okay. This is reality. This isn't just the way we live in heaven. I want to live with the feel, the power of relevance. Though no man would ever see it in you, God sees it in you. And you feel what God sees in you. That's power. That's carrying the reward everywhere. You can be in prison and you have that reward resonating in you, don't you? Well, that's the romanced heart of the bride. That's the the gift of verse 7. The utterly despised, the reward is in the power to love and to feel it. The bride's final intercession for the church. What's happening here? Again, I just have a a, a few moments here. We have 40 pages, so I'm just going to sum up the next couple pages. We have a little sister. She has no breast. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she is spoken for? If she's a wall, we'll build upon her a battlement of silver. If she's a door, we'll enclose her with boards of cedar. She's speaking to the the bride is speaking to Jesus. Thus, this is a prayer. She's overflowing from the seal of bridal love from the last session. She now moves into intercession. She says, Lord, I'm not going to forget the little sister. What about her? I've entered into the romance. My heart is overflowing. What about? What about the immature one? She's captured with the little sister who doesn't have the ability to enter into love. It's depicted as a young girl that's undeveloped in love. The inability to reproduce, the inability to nurture others in the milk of the word. She says, Lord, it's not just about you and me. For, for, all, for many chapters, it was, for at least four chapters, it was just her and the Lord. She goes, The little sister that can't help others right now effectively, who can't enter into the romance. She's young. She's undeveloped in love. She doesn't even understand bridal romance. What about her, Lord, is what she's saying. What can we do for her? And and I develop that theme. In the day when she is spoken for, the day when she is spoken for, let's go to that. The day she's spoken for. There's a season in God, in everyone's life, when the Lord begins to draw us consciously into the romance and give us revelation. The day that she's spoken for is the day that a young woman is spoken for, I mean, the day a young woman is spoken for is the day of her wedding. That's specifically what it's talking about in the natural story. She's saying, in the day when she understands she's called to a wedding, 
The day when she's awakened to her destiny and where she's going and what partnership she's called to. And the day when her eyes open as to who she is. What are we going to do for her? So the, so the bride is praying for the younger members of the body, knowing one day she will be awakened. Some of you in this course, this day, it's a season. It's not a 24-hour day. It's in, the, it's in this last 10 weeks. You've been awakened. It's a season where you're understanding that you've been spoken for in a bridal way. It's a season where the reality of your destiny as a bride and as a cherished one that's crowned in beauty is dawning on you. And when that dawns on the little sisters, then she wants to begin to enter into effective ministry for others. If she's a wall, we'll build upon her a battlement of silver. But if she's a door, we'll enclose her with boards of cedar. What the bride is saying to the Lord is, I'm going to be attentive to the responses that she makes to you in the day that she's spoken for. When her heart is awakened to romance, when her heart is awakened to love, when she matures as to what's going on, she's going to re respond one of two general ways. She's going to respond as a wall or she's going to respond as a door. And, and the uh, bride is saying to the Lord in prayer, let's respond to her according to her response. Now I have written in here, and there's quite a few verses even in the New Testament by the apostles using the very language of, 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 this, uh, of these last verses here. If she's a wall, if she becomes a ministry that is a wall of protection that guards others from the enemy, the wall is spoken of in two ways. The wall is reference to the pastoral ministry, and the wall is a reference to the prophetic ministry. Uh, some of you in this room will respond to the Lord in the day you're spoken for, in the day when you're awakened to who you are in the Lord, you will rise up and want to be a protection, a protection of wall for the young ones from the onslaught of the enemy. You will want to be a ministry that guards and protects. Others of you, as a wall, will want to be the line of demarcation that stands strong and that, and that causes the, the, uh, the wall to be built, that makes a stand against the onslaught. It's a very different thing. That, that dimension is the prophetic. Some people are called to respond to the Lord in ministry that way. Others are called to respond to the Lord as a door. Those that are at door are those that open up the door of grace. Paul used that imagery many times in the epistles. A door of grace. The evangelist opens the door for the brand new ones, but the teacher opens the door of revelation as well. And so what the bride is saying, in the day that she is spoken for, how are we going to build in her according to how she's responded to you? So this, this is a passion-based uh, strategy. It's a, it's a strategy tailor-made for each individual according to the response of their heart. And building on her a battlement of silver, the, the bride is saying, we're going to make her strong and powerful. And if we're going to enclose her in boards of cedar, Jesus is the cedar of Lebanon. We're going to clothe her in the anointing. And I develop why the imagery uh, is, uh, uh, is along these lines, where according to how she responds, the bride says, Lord, let's go and equip her and cause her to be successful. That's what's going on in verse 8 and 9. So this is her page, uh, I mean, eight and nine is her intercession to the Lord. What about the little sister? What are we going to do for her? Let's build in her. Let's, let's anoint her. Let's equip her. His apost her apostolic passion for the others, the weak ones, the broken ones. It's, she's lost in the second commandment here, the joy of love for broken and weak people. She says, it's not enough that I can go on in the Lord, just enjoying the Lord myself. What about the others? Oh, what a powerful reality when the Lord burns and stamps his zeal upon our heart for his people. Okay, now, in different directions. She's changing directions now. Now she's describing three dimensions of the overflow of her own heart. She says, I am a wall, number one. My breasts are like towers. My ability to nurture is contrary to nature. It's supernatural. And number three, I became in his eyes as one that has, is overflowing in the peace of God. I am a wall. She says, I know the truth of my life. When no one's looking, I live for the protection of others. She has this witness in her spirit that her whole being is caught up in selfless labors for other people. She goes, when I think of myself, I'm not trying to build something, a name for myself, or to build a comfortable lifestyle, or to carve a little niche out for myself. 
that the only reason why I'm alive on the earth, she says, is to be a wall of protection for others. And she has the witness in her spirit. She's a selfless to, uh, uh, ministry that lives and pours herself out for others. And I have a number of verses where Paul the Apostle made the same confessions. What a powerful reality when we connect on the inside with why we have life on planet earth. Even most believers are trying to figure out what their life is about. Even born again, forgiven, a little bit of ministry, even some with large ministries, they go, they, 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 uh, they uh, squander, uh, not squander, but they uh, flounder through life with uncertainty as to what even they're supposed to do. She knows. She goes, I'm a wall. I get up in the morning and I breathe for one reason, to be a, a wall of protection and a wall of demarcation for the purpose of God. And there's a witness in my spirit. It is truth. She's come to grips with who she is. It's more than that. It's more than she's selfless. She says, my ability to nurture is supernatural. It's beyond the boundaries of nature. I have the capacity to give the milk of the word at a level that it can only be explained by God himself. She flows in the revelation of the milk of the word in such abundance that the multitudes are fed out of the resource of her experience. And then she says, I have become in his eyes as one who's found peace. She's living in... I hope you'll, I think you'll enjoy the notes because what I do in the notes is develop why this means this from other parts of the scripture. I, she says, then I became in his eyes. She's living before an audience of one. She goes, I live before his eyes. I mean, she is, she is uh, fear free. She's shame free. People criticize her, and I, I put it in a number of places where Paul the Apostle was even in the church he was criticized. And he says, I live before my God. She, he lived in the power of the awareness that he lived before an audience of one. Oh, beloved, when we can connect with truth where we live before his eyes. Elijah said in 1 Kings 17, I believe it's verse 3, he says, The Lord God before whom I live... And then he went to speak, uh, he, he does this and does that. But it's the Lord before whom he lived. The problem in the body of Christ, the reason that we have such, we, ha we spend so much of our emotional energy managing all of our rejection complexes because we live before the eyes of others. We live by the voice of others. And if they're happy, we're happy. If they're sad, we're sad. But typically, if they're happy, we're worried they're not going to be happy tomorrow. Even when they're happy, we're not happy because we think it's not going to last. And we just live in constant emotional management of rejection and fear. And we never, she goes, before his eyes, I have connected with him with whom I have to do. Before his eyes, I live and I know that I'm selfless. I'm a wall. I know I have no agendas, no motives besides the purpose of God. And I know that I'm skillful. I have the ability to nurture like towers. I have capacities that are outside of the realm of, of, of just human abilities. She goes, I live before his eyes. And I resonate in the peace of God. Oh, when this kind of supernatural peace, uh, if, uh, Philippians 4, 7, when this peace flows in our spirit, Enjoying the focus of living before the audience of one. The voice of the bridegroom is the voice that defines her. She lives before one and she's filled with peace. Paul was the wealthiest man on the earth. Even in prison, even whipped in stone because he resonated in supernatural peace. And he carried the power of his joy everywhere he went. He carried the reward in him. When they criticized him, he says, I know I'm a wall. I know I have no false motives in it. I'm in it strictly for the kingdom of God. He meant that. He knew it in truth before God. When they undermined his abilities as an apostle in 2 Corinthians 10 to 13, he could say, my abilities are supernatural. I can nurture you with capacities equal to a tower. When they said, yeah, but your life is worthless, he says, I live as before one. And peace reigns in me. Oh, what? just think of the energy we would have. If, if all of our, of our emotional energies were freed up from all this management of self-doubt and rejection, imagine what we would feel like on the inside. The wealthiest man in the earth, Paul the Apostle in his day. 
Now she's going to go to this. Her peace is impacted because she has a revelation of eternity. That's what's happening. She has a revelation that these small acts of her earthly life, the small decisions have eternal relevance and eternal remembrance. That's what's going on here. She lives in the power of relevance. I mean, imagine you feel successful. You feel selfless. You feel you're operating according to the, to the design that God has created you with. You feel invincible. You feel relevant in everything that you're doing. What a powerful way to live. She says, Solomon has a vineyard at Bel Hammon. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. Now she's speaking of a sea. The vineyard belongs to the king. Solomon has a vineyard. And we know that Jesus is the king throughout the song. The vineyard is the people of God. The Lord Jesus has a vineyard. We know that. He possesses something that belongs to him, but it's for this age, it's in time and space. It's his people. It's his divine purpose in a fallen age. He has a vineyard in a dark and fallen world. It's a vineyard at Bel Hammon. Now, Bel Hammon means there's no mention in the scripture or in Israel's history of any geographic place named this. And so the commentators and the scholars are a, a bit uh, mystified as to how to translate it. And a number of translations simply translate what it means rather than trying to assign a name of a city. They just name it. And it means in the Hebrew, a populous one or literally the father of a multitude. King Jesus, the king of eternity, has a vineyard, and that vineyard for only a f some, some uh, 6,000 years is in the natural world in time and space. And this vineyard is going to become the father of a multitude. It's going to explode in, in numbers. King Jesus has a very large vineyard, a vineyard that touches all the ends of the earth. It's a very large worldwide vineyard. Now, the king, the eternal king, entrusts his eternal vineyard. While it's in this fallen world, he entrusts it to keepers. He owns it. It's an eternal vineyard. But he, he leases it or he, he uh, uh, what's the word, uh, delegates portions of it to keepers throughout the earth, throughout his vineyard. Solomon has a vineyard. He leases the vineyard to the keepers. This speaks of the principle of the kingdom of God in this age is being entrusted to the church. He entrusts, he delegates his eternal vineyard only in time and space to fallen people on the earth. He entrusts or he delegates parts of it. Now, interesting is that Jesus taught in the parable of how he leased his vineyard to his servants before he went to a faraway country. Matthew 21, verse 33 to 44, in his last sermon, it's the same sermon where he teaches the kingdom of God is like a king preparing, a, uh, 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 arranging a wedding for his son. In the very same message, just the parable before, the kingdom of God is likened to a vineyard of which the king leased to keepers. I mean, it is directly out of Song of Solomon 8. I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus is referencing Song of Solomon 8 because in Matthew 22, just one chapter over, he talks directly about the wedding. I believe he is literally drawing upon the analogy of Song of Solomon, I mean drawing from the scriptures of Song of Solomon 8 where he says, I have a vineyard and I'm leasing it to keepers and I'm going to require an answer and I will reward the answer that I receive if it's a good answer. The kingdom of God is the rightful property of Jesus. He's entrusting it to his church. We are living in a time frame when the Lord is in a faraway country. That's part of the parable that I didn't quote. He's entrusting the resources of his kingdom and even responsibility for portions of his kingdom to his keepers while he's in a faraway country in eternity. The keepers are those that he entrusts responsibility to. In other words, each one of us each one of us are to understand our life as a keeper in whom God has entrusted a portion of his vineyard, even if it's only one or two people. 
All of us have been given a certain stewardship before God. You don't have to wait for a pastor to define your calling to serve. I have people come up and they say, we need permission. I says, not really. I mean, I'm happy to tell you, go evangelize. But the Word of God has told you to do it. You have a far uh, weightier authority than any human uh, uh, voice can give you. And I, I don't want to... Uh, undermine the, the dynamics that God uses in the human arena, but every one of us have been entrusted with a portion of the vineyard from the Lord, and you don't need a, a human leader to tell you what it is. It's yours now, regardless if a leader ever defines it accurately to you. Chances are, the leadership of the church might tell you the wrong place and the wrong thing to do. Find where your heart is and do it. When you live before the eyes of one, you don't have, all, you don't have as many steps. You don't have to, to, to get all the, uh, the human levels to sign off and to pat you on the back. You can go out because you're living before the eyes of him. And I believe there's a, a place to see your, your ministry labors coordinate in the larger strategy of a local church. But that's different than, from being paralyzed and immobilized till a human being gives you permission to witness to somebody. And the body of Christ is surprisingly paralyzed, waiting for permission. You've already been given a portion of the vineyard, even if it's a small portion to begin, because that's the Lord's way. He gives us ones and twos to start with. Ones and twos. I remember the first several years of, of, of uh, my walk with the Lord. My leaders told me, they said, hey, you have the word of God, you have the Holy Spirit, go for it. They said, go win some people to the Lord and start discipling them. I go, how do you do it? They said, well, you'll learn more by doing it than us telling you. I go, well, like, give me an idea. They said, well, lead a couple of them to the Lord, then have them at your house, and then go through the Bible, start in John, and just tell them whatever you think. I said, really? That's how you do it? They go, that's good enough. I mean, they were, they were wise leaders. So I went out and led two or three people to the Lord, and I led multitudes of Bible studies. I mean, multitudes, hundreds and hundreds of them the first five years that, ne- that had between two and five in attendance for years. And I was learning the word of God and praise God they didn't tape them and they were lots of heresies, no doubt. But I was working right through everything, you know, and these little, they were like, a, I was nine months old in the Lord and they were two months old in the Lord and they were going, wow. And I go, oh yeah, that's what that means. And, uh, <laughs> but I learned the word of God by becoming a keeper over twos and threes. I mean, literally for a number of years, most of my ministry was over twos and threes. I didn't wait for a leader to tell me. I didn't wait for them to give me permission. I had one youth leader just says, go start doing it. So I went out, I was 16 years old, got a bunch of 13-year-old junior high kids that would believe me. They, I don't know if they were ever really converted or not, but they said they were. And I taught them the Bible and who knows what, how that came out. And I did it week after week. I ended up with two and three Bible studies a week. For the first three to five years, I was consumed in teaching them. And I don't hardly recall a Bible study over five, except for, I mean, I remember the big one. We had 30. That was the, like, the one we got like nervous three days ahead of time, was the 30 one. But we, most of all of my Bible studies were three to five. And lots of people are just want to skip that first 10 years and go right in some other arena. And I just, and I think if you're burning on fire, get three people in your house and start. Just start. You don't need anybody's permission. The king who owns the vineyard has already entrusted part of it to you. You're one of the keepers. Go for it. Go for it. Do it before his eyes. And, and I was surprised that all of a sudden more people started showing up. You know, I thought, well, this is fun. And then the people that showed up started getting mad at me because I didn't do it the way that I thought, whoa, that's got a funny dynamic to it. And it, all kinds of little surprises begin to happen. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. This is what she understands. That every keeper, every keeper was to bring fruit as they cultivate through hard work the portion of the vineyard that God gave them. Every one of them, the Lord would ask them for an account. Now, when we hear that, we, we, because of our unrenewed minds, our negative mindset, when we think of eternity and account, we go, oh no. When if you understand it, you think of eternity and account, you go, oh yes, because he pays so well. He pays so well. One cup of cold water is amazing what he gives. He pays so well. Don't go, oh no, go, oh yes. Every movement of my heart, every individual I touch, he pays you when you bring the fruit. It's an amazing thing. But she connects with the idea that her training and her labors on the earth matter because 
The Olympics won't be canceled. She will be rewarded before the Lord for everything she does. She connects with her labors before the eyes of the Lord. Fruit is brought, and he answers that fruit with a reward. He smiles on it and crowns us for it. Every day of her life is relevant now. It doesn't matter what position of life. You can be in a prison. You can be on a sick bed. You can be in a welfare line. You can be stuck out in a desert, stranded somewhere. Every day will matter if you live before his eyes and go, okay, let's do it today. And you get a revelation that he pays well for every movement of your heart towards him. And, and begin to lay aside the pain and the anguish of the great hour on the earth when everything will seem important because that hour may never come except through revelation that we see every little thing is important. I, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet some, some uh, well-known ministries that have large public profiles, and I am surprised. I'm not, I'm not anymore, but in the last 10 years, I'm surprised at the, the level of discontentment and anguish that men who speak to thousands have about the irrelevance of their life. It's mind-blowing to me. I, I thought, does anybody ever enter into the joy of feeling relevant? Is the numbers ever big enough? I don't believe it comes from numbers. I think it comes from revelation that there's a vineyard that he's leased and we bring the fruit and he looks at the fruit and he answers us for the fruit. It comes from revelation, not the size of the response of people because you think if it's a hundred, you get there, you'll fill it. But when you're a hundred, it seems, it seems uh, 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 like it's not important then. There's never a number. There, enough is never enough. It's like money. You never have enough. I mean, here we have Bill Gates, $50 billion dollars going to go to court. He wants 50 billion more. I mean, he's already richer than the second richest guy in the world times five, but he wants, he says, wait a second, you're ripping me off. I want more power. And I thought, when is enough ever enough? And the same is true with God's servants in the ministry. It comes by revelation, not by response of people, the number of people responding. It really doesn't come there, and, and, and I, I'm not saying that as a, the final authority, but my observations in life meeting on some number of people that talk to thousands, most of them in their spirits feel very dissatisfied with their place in the kingdom. I thought, where is this? And I just feel the Holy Spirit's answer is, it's not in size. It's in the revelation of the, the, of the, the king who leases it and then rewards us for every movement of our heart and every cup of cold water. It's found in revelation. And if you can tap into this one thing, your life feels relevant and powerful now. And the feeling of being wasted is one of the most debilitating feelings surpassed only by being rejected and by feeling filled with shame. Rejection, shame, and waste is how most people feel all the days of their life. I tell you, in the gospel of the kingdom, we don't have to live paralyzed by the feeling of rejection, the feeling of shame, and the feeling of wasted, irrelevant lives because we don't have people and money before us in a way that seems like makes our life relevant. The king makes us relevant because we're living before his eyes. Everyone was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. A thousand is an indication of the full response of the heart back to God. It's a complete number that speaks of fullness and full return. Speaks of the full measure God requires according to what he's trusted. He wants a thousand from everybody. Symbolically, he wants a response from us according to whatever giftedness he's given us. One person, he says, your whole sphere will only be to touch one, one person every now and then. That's the only sphere I've given you. And that's the full response I want from you. And I want you to enjoy the fact you've given me everything I've given you. You've responded right. I want you to live in the power of it and you'll carry the reward of life with you everywhere and you'll be one of the rare ones of the earth that enter into the romanced heart. The vineyard was rented out with an expectation of return. The Lord wants a return and he's going to pay so well for whatever fruit he gets. Nearing the end here. Now she answers. Oh, this is her assurance of her own maturity and victory. She goes, my vineyard is before me. You, O oh Solomon, you can have the thousand you want. I can answer to you in love for that which you gave me. What a fantastic, powerful way to live. She goes, I know that I can give you that which you've asked of me. 
This doesn't mean that she doesn't have weakness. This doesn't mean she doesn't have failure. But she knows that her heart is fully given to the Lord in whatever measure. It doesn't matter what the measure is. The idea is that we give what the Lord asks from us. She's able to give what Jesus expects from her. So, and, I, and I describe the emotional dynamics related to, ha- to feeling like you're a tower. You have skillful abilities, feeling like a wall. You're selfless, you protect. Feeling in the eyes of God with peace because all that he's given you, you know you've answered according to what pleases him. This is the spiritual violence we talked about Sunday. The violent take it by force. The violent live in the pleasure of this kind of romanced heart. Oh, again, the the energy we spend managing our rejection, managing our shame, managing our sense of feeling irrelevant when right before us is is our small things, but those are the the only things he's ever asked for us to do. We're waiting for big things, and we despise the small things because we're waiting for the big things. And the small things is where the pleasure of the Lord is that he will give us right in front of us. He goes, that's all I asked of you was to give what I asked for from you. Tell you, you could go to bed happy tonight. You really could. You could say, hey, this is happening. I, I'm going to be a wall. I'm doing this for God. I'm going to equip myself. And I'm going to live before an audience of one. And I'm going to live in the joy of a relevant life that nobody can steal from me. Yeah. Why not? I'm going for it. You'll carry the reward everywhere you go. I'm going to skip this one. It talks about team ministry. It's, a, it, it's an excellent principle of team ministry. She understands her, her, uh, the dynamics of team ministry. Let's skip it. Oh, yeah, that's where we are. My vineyard is before me. Okay, there you are. I was already here. My own vineyard is before me. Do you remember back in chapter 1, verse 6, her vineyard was unkept, remember? Now her vineyard is flourishing. She's done the will of God, and she has the confidence to know it. This whole section is about confidence and assurance of relevance, of doing right before God. And these things no human can give you. You can only find these in the seal. You can only find these in the abandonment of living before his eyes. No human being can give you the definitions to where you will feel confident before God. You can go to your leaders and say, I just want to feel better about it. They can help a little bit, and they will help a little bit. But when it's all said and done, the only thing that will give you assurance is when you've silenced all the voice of everyone else and you feel from him what he wants from you. And he might say, I just want you faithful in the prayer room right now. And I want you to touch a few people in your neighborhood. I want you to touch a couple of children at children's church. That one guy at the office. And that's all I want for now. But enjoy me enjoying you doing it. I'm not asked of anything else. Enjoy it now. Enjoy me enjoying you. Enjoy me watching you and enjoy the process of it now. And live. let the agony of living before the eyes of men to make a great world impact. Changing all of history. There's no reward in changing history. Anybody that changes history, it's been given to them as a gift from God to do it. The pay's not greater for changing history. God only pays us and rewards us according to the fact that we've done what he said to do. Whether you raise the dead or take a nap, the pay is truly the same. Changing history is not noble for the next 20 billion years in eternity. What is noble is doing the will of God before his eyes. Not changing history. And the strife we have to make a big impact is this. It destroys our ability to interact with God in the present tense. It truly does. The Lord's, fi- Jesus' final commission to the bride. He says, you who dwell in the gardens, the companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. What a powerful thing going on here. You who dwell in the gardens. What's happening is that she's in the church. She's in the gardens. The gardens is the church. That's where Jesus was in chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. She goes, you're in the gardens. You say, well, that's wonderful. Well, most people that have been in the kingdom for a while, most believers that are in their 60s, they're out of the church. They're at home watching, I would like to say Christian TV, but most of it isn't Christian. Most believers that have been in the kingdom for years and years are so disappointed. They had so many wrong thought processes and so many wrong expectations. They're, they're disappointed at God. They're disappointed that, that they were not given more honor in the church. They're disappointed that their anointing didn't bear the kind of fruit they thought. They're so, their hearts are so bound and burned over with disappointment. They're not in the garden anymore. They're at home biding time. 
I look at all of these, fo- these places where the old folks live, and my heart pains. Some people say, I've gone and visited sometimes. They go, 50 years of the Lord. I think, what are you doing here in boredom watching TV 10 hours a day then? I don't mean the fact that they're in the place, but with no vision, nothing to do. A locked heart. She's still in the gardens. She's still in the midst, cultivating the garden, and she's been on the journey for years. Powerful. I talk about that. Her companions listen to her voice. She has credibility. She's not lost her testimony. She hasn't been disqualified. She's not lost her way. She still is making an impact in the guards. This is powerful. The Lord says, let me tell you something. He goes, I want to hear your voice too. He goes, I want to remind you. As the multitudes are coming, whatever the multitudes are, it may be from 10 to 20, the increase as you've matured. I don't want you so busy that you forget. This is about you and me loving each other. I want to hear your voice. Remember, it's about you and me in love. He says, let me hear your voice as your prosperity in ministry is increasing. How many ministries, when they're in the gardens and the companions really listen to them, they don't have time to speak before the Lord. That's called prayer and intercession. I develop those ideas. These these are magnificent ideas. I don't mean my development of them, but these principles are so vital for apostolic ministry, for leadership principles. Because when folks, again, are in the gardens and the companions are listening, they get too busy for prayer and intercession, for worship. They're too busy to do the I love you, just like they did in the early days. The Lord says, in all of your prosperity and ministry, let me hear your voice. It's about love, remember. And of course, the very thing she's uh, very happy to do. The Lord wants to hear her voice in four ways. He wants to hear her voice in worship, number one. He wants to hear her voice in teaching. He doesn't want her heart locked in discouragement. Now, this is a little different than what I was saying a moment, ago, a moment ago. It's the person who gets discouraged and quits. He goes, I want to hear you instructing and opening doors. He wants to hear her voice in evangelism, and then he wants to hear her voice in intercession. The Lord goes, I, I want you to stay fired up in the Holy Spirit according to the wisdom of God. I, want, I don't want your voice silenced. What is the enemy trying to do? Silence our voice. Our voice before the body through shame and rejection and discouragement and burnout. And he wants to silence our voice before God by having a prosperous ministry. The enemy wants to silence our voice and God wants to hear it. We talk about that in these, past, I mean, these pages. Then she ends in verse 37. She goes, okay, you want to hear my voice? Then she gives the, the, she responds in love. She goes, make haste, hurry. Come to me quickly, the one I love. I love you. I love you. Come to me. She says, quickly embrace me in intimacy. And the Lord says, yeah, that's what I want. I want you to to hear the urgency that you want me to come quickly to you. And then I want to hear the urgency and intercession. You want me to come quickly for you. That's the second coming. This is the same prayer you find in the end of the book of Revelation. I have it all recorded there. Maranatha, come quickly. She says, oh, Lord, there's urgency, there's zeal. Come to me, my lover. Come. She's hot in love at the end. The journey ends with urgency in worship and energy, uh, urgency in intercession. She's asking the lover to come quickly like a gazelle, but he's coming from the mountain of spices. Oh, what a powerful imagery this is. The mountain of spices. Let's look at this. The beauty of the eternal city. The mountains are unusual. They're spectacular. The mountains of spice is the place of unbroken communion with the Lord face to face. This is our greatest longing. Remember the Lord called her. He was on the mountains back in chapter 2, verse 8 and 10. He says, rise, come. And she said, no. Now he's on the mountain. She says, oh, I want to do the mountain thing with you all the way, forever and forever. A mountain of spices. What romantic, romantic imagery. The fragrance, the pleasure, the beauty of the eternal city, the abundance and diversity of the spices. There's not one fragrance and one spice. The, if there was a bed of spices in his personality in chapter 5, verse 13, and if the church is a bed of spices, eternal city is a mountain of spices, of diversity, of feelings, and, and uh, passion, and fragrance, and beauty. It's spectacular, and that's where she's going, and to a spectacular 
spectacular encounter forever and forever on the mountain of God. And she says, oh, come quickly to me in intimacy and come quickly for me at the second coming. My life on the earth has only found its meaning in you coming to me, either in the spirit or in person in the sky. My life on the earth is only important to me in as much as it pleases you. Paul the Apostle said it's those who uh, love his appearing. I remember when I first read that, those who love his appearing, you think, well, everyone loves his appearing. No, not really. Most of the church doesn't love his appearing. You say, yes, they do. No, most of the church is so rooted and grounded in their business and their own dreams happening and their own ministries flourishing, if the Lord was to take them in physical death right now, that's the Lord's appearing. They'd say, no, no, oh, ah, no, no way. I will stay here as long as I can. And I understand that we want to fulfill the mandate of God. But most people aren't anxious for the face-to-face. I remember one guy said, he says, I love the Lord, but I'm not homesick yet. The bride's homesick. I'm not talking about having a casual attitude towards physical death. That's not my point. But her life, her vision is the Lord. She says, Lord, I want you. And if it's here for a long time or a short time, I just want you. I only want to be down here for you. And most believers... They want the Lord, but only after many, many years and all their goals are accomplished on the earth. And Paul said, oh, those that love his appearing, no strings attached. They want the Lord to stand before them. Amen. Let's stand. Oh, what about the little sisters? Oh, we have so much pain in our own lives. We don't think much about the little sisters. We think about our ministries growing, but we don't really think about the burdensome little sisters. We want our ministry to increase. But we don't want to mess around with people. It's like I heard the man say, preachers love crowds, but they don't love people. It's true. It's true mostly through the whole body of Christ. We love, we love responses and meetings, but God's raising up a, a leadership that loves people, not just crowds. Not just the story of ministry. The little sisters that cause the trouble that cost so much that have no ability to nurture, that aren't developed in love yet. They don't even understand what's going on. Oh, Lord, we want to love the sisters. Lord, what are we going to do for them? Our our life is captured with our responsibility to help them, to build on them if they become a wall, to enclose them in cedars if they become a door, to see them anointed in in the fragrant cedars of Lebanon. She says, I'm a wall. I know that I'm selfless. I know before God I have the witness of my conscience. I'm doing it for Him. I know that my ability to minister is this tower. It's supernatural. It's, it's beyond human dimension. And I live as one that finds peace. I resonate with an overflowing heart. I live as before your eyes. One of the reasons I have peace is, Lord, your vineyard. The one that you've leased out to the keepers. The one that you've asked for fruit from. I can give you that which you've asked. I live with one agenda to do that which you've put before me. I'm in the garden serving your flock. I haven't quit. I haven't given up. I haven't been disqualified. My companions hear my voice. The Lord says, well, let me hear it. Don't let your voice ever be silenced by the enemy. Let me hear it. Don't let your voice be silenced by even busyness of prosperity. Let me hear your voice. Well, then come, Lord. Come to me. Oh, come quickly. Make haste like a gazelle. Come quickly. I want you. Embrace us now. Oh, and the Lord, come for me. Whatever your timing is, whatever your timing is in the second coming or my personal appearing before you, come for me in your perfect timing. I trust you. Oh, take me to the mountain of spices, that spectacular romance, and the ages that goes on that's so diverse and endless in its splendor oh take me to the mountain of spices my God the romanced heart the overflowing heart of the bride oh more love more power our inheritance is in heaven it's not on the earth our inheritance is in the in the city of God our primary inheritance more of you Oh, Lord.
Lord, we want to romance heart. We want our heart romance. Oh, we want to live in the power of love is in these last verses. With all of my heart, and I will worship you. With all of my mind, and I will worship you. With all of my strength, you are my. Oh, we want to worship you. Make haste. Come to us. Oh, come to us, Lord. We're not too busy in the gardens to hearken to you to come to us in intimacy. All of my heart, and I will worship you. With all of my Lord, give us towers of revelation. We ask towers of revelation for the body of Christ. With all of my strength, you are my Lord. Some of you are a wall, and others of you are a door. You are my Lord wants to anoint you if you will respond to Him. He will give you towers of revelation in your season. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.